and I'll show you some pictures from that. Um, so today we're going to talk about the real important rice, not Condoleezza rice, but the rice around the world. <coughs> So here, uh, uh, in this picture that I begin with, is just to show you some of the variation that exists in the rice world. We are accustomed to eating this type of rice, pro probably more the white one, polished rice. But there's a lot of variation just in grain color. There you can see some reds, some purples, and what are considered some blacks here, and some brown rice there. And uh, we're going to try to explore some of the genetics and biology of the crop that allows us to try to exploit that uh, variation in rice to see if we can eventually produce more food. So let me start by saying that no matter what other people say, if you're going to be a plant breeder, you have to learn to take shots to other people. So no matter what crop you work, that's the most important crop in the world. So today, rice is the most important crop in the world. And it is. It is not only by the means of production, the size of, of area that is planted, but by the amount of people who eat it, who eats it and depends on rice. Uh, here in the States and other parts of the developing world, uh, carbohydrates coming from rice are not as important as other parts of the world, like Southeast Asia, for example, where essentially there are countries like Bangladesh where 70% of their diet comes from rice. Okay? And uh, it's a staple for half of the world population, and, it's, and it keeps growing as most of the population growth that is coming in the, future, in the near future is going to be in the developing world. It is widely cultivated. It is cultivated in different environments, in different heights and, and latitudes, from sea level to up to 3,000 meters. Uh, it is also cultivated in many growing conditions. And by growing conditions, uh, it means the, the water regimen where rice is grown. Uh, rice is grown from dry upland conditions, like in mountain con uh, conditions, irrigated, submerged, and in some cases, floating rices. And here are some pictures of the different systems. Here are some of the terraces in the Himalayan mountains. A guy in Malaysia uh, already harvesting the, the rice, mostly used for feedstock in that case. Here is rice in dry conditions in Central America. And here is myself planting some rice back home a long time ago, under water conditions, transplanting it. OK? So this uh, also planted in valleys. <laughs> and also in mountainous conditions, as you can see. Of the major world producers, uh, half of the production, yeah. Where are you from? I'm from Honduras, in Central America. So um, most of the world producers, most of the world production, actually 50%, is essentially concentrated in two countries, <laughs> India and China. And as you can see, just by that pie chart, 50% uh, of that production is concentrated in that area, and most of the other Asian countries dominate, essentially probably Brazil and Japan and a little bit of the USA. USA is very particular in that most of the production is exported. Okay? And the rest of the world produces the, a little bit like 10 or 20% of, of the world population. Also here, you can see in this map the distribution of the, pro, of the production based on the number of countries that produce rice. It is estimated that 114 countries produce rice around the world. And the color determines just the amount of rice that is produced. Uh, the real paradox about rice production and rice-based uh, diets is that although you produce a large amount of food, you also produce a lot of nutritional deficiencies. Okay? Uh, most of the nutritional compounds and the properties that rice has is concentrated in the outer layers of the rice that we usually polish out. Not only because of, of, of the storage issue that, that raises up, but also because uh, the brand of rice has a lot of anti-nutritional compounds that don't allow humans to absorb the nutrients, okay? So one of the main deficiencies in the world, especially if you overlay it, if you see the production areas, for example, China and India, and you overlay the deficiencies in vitamin A, you can see them. both of them are either moderate subclinical or severe, okay? Clinical condition, causing a lot of uh, transformation and developmental problems in, in those parts of the world. And that's the real paradox of, of, of all this. So one of the major areas of improvement that, that rice is going on is trying to enhance the nutritional quality of rice. And hopefully in the future that will be done in, in different ways. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the history of rice. Uh, rice uh, was domesticated independently at least two times. Uh, some people, and that's debatable like everything else that is in evolution and domestication literature. 
Uh, just in Asia, can, you can name two independent domestication, probably one in, in China and the other one in the Indo-Chinese plains. Uh, but right now, as people are trying to agree, two at least of them, one in Asia and one in Africa. In Asia was the Orisa Saitaiva species derived from all Rufi Pogon in the China and India. And in Africa, it's a, a different species that is cultivated. It's called Orisa glabarima, okay? And it was derived from another wild ancestor of rice that is called Orisa barthai. Okay, in the Niger River Delta. Interestingly, too, it was introduced in the States in 1689 in South Carolina, and it, it was brought by the slave trade. And uh, records, if you go uh, to literature and also in the, on the web, you can find that uh, if you were a slave, especially a woman that knew about rice cultivation, you were essentially purchased at a higher price. There was a premium on slave knowledge about rice production, and that came from Africa. Okay, and that's interesting because Rice was brought to this country, and then it was cultivated by slaves, essentially. And it prospered in South Carolina until the slave abolishment, okay? So here is the wild relative of rice, of Orisa saitaiva. This is what is Orisa rufipogon. Just, just for you to have an idea, this is just a four-inch pot. And this is a plant that probably has, uh, I think at that time was three months growing up. And this is a line uh, of cultivated rice, one of the most cultivated varieties at that time here in the States. It's called Jefferson. And just to see the proportion here is this is a line that probably is as tall as one meter, one meter and 40 centimeters. And this one is, keeps growing all the, all the way up to the roof if you let it go. At the same time, it's perennial. It has a lot of the weedy traits. As you can see, multiple tillering, a huge amount of seeds that it produces, especially small seed. It has, the seed also has some on. And at that time, I think it's just flowering. At that time, you, you might not be able to recognize it. Yeah, you can see some here. Uh, the grain of, the, of, uh, of, of those plants are red, which is characteristic of wild, of weedy rice. And this one is completely different, small plant, just a few tillers producing seeds, large grain, uh, white in color. And those are some of the traits that uh, differentiate between the weedy and the, and the cultivated rice, okay? But essentially, it's not difficult to imagine that that plan came. The change hasn't been as, 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 as dramatic as it was in rice and uh, as we saw in the last presentation. Okay? Questions right now? But uh, also, it's interesting that rice is, the Orisa genus by itself is one of, of, of the most diverse ones. Uh, it is comprised of at least 20 species that are related to one another and 20 more that are considered close relatives. Uh, the haploid basic number for the species is 12, and there are at least six genomes that have been identified in rice, in the rice genome, in the rice genus, and they are designated from A to F. And there are species that are diploids, and the only genomes that exist in diploids are A, B, C, E, and F. The D doesn't exist in the diploid stage, and then there are also species allotetraploids that exist in the in this two, B, B, C, C, and C, C, and D, D. Okay. Uh, the, the hypothesis why DD is not a high diploid is because it's supposed to be um, a derivative between C and E. And it is, uh, the hypothesis is that it was outcompeted from the diploid stage. And the only way that it was uh, preserved in nature was in this stage. Okay? Uh, interestingly enough, that all cultivated species in rice, even in Africa and in Asia, are all from the double A genome. So two independent domestication, same genome. Okay? Uh, if you go in deeper into the uh, Indica subspecies now, yeah, you will find out that diversity is not only in the genus level, but also at the species level. Here is just the tree, the uh, phylogenetic tree of uh, the Indica subspecies. And within Indica, there are five different groups, okay, or subspecies. So one is the Indica, one is the Ausch, and the other one is the Tropical Japonica, Temperate Japonica, and the Aromatic group. The color that you see in that tree is basically red and, and, and blue. If you, if you drew a line here, you will see the typical division between the Indica and the Japonica types, okay? Where well, you will probably eat more dish every day, and this is for sticky rice or sushi type of rice, you know, small grain, plum, uh, used for uh, other preparation in Asian cuisines, okay? But this is the typical divide. There are essentially two groups, Indica and the Japonica origin. And the color itself indicates a possible derivative of these groups. So you can see here that in this part, most of the lines here are red, 
okay? But there are some blues and greens, which means that there are some interrogations coming from both groups. The same is here, but mostly in the Indica, okay? Where you can see more blue than red in the Japonica. Uh, Aus is another group that is derived from the Indica, and the aromatics are supposed to be derivatives from temperate and tropical Japonicas. Okay, so these are the five groups. And this is important for, from the plant breeding point of view because if you made a cross between these groups, which ones would you expect to have the highest heterosis? If you were to select two groups to cross, which ones would you expect to be, to give you the, the highest heterosis? If you cross, for example, Indica with Aus, would that give you higher uh, heterosis than Indica with temperate Japonica? Why? That's right, and the basic of heterosis is essentially to produce the most heterozygous sites possible, right? So the most, the most different groups are the ones that are gonna give you the highest heterosis, and in this case, the highest heterosis in rice is when you cross a temperate Japonica with an Indica cross, okay? And then also erases all their type of sexual incompatibilities and sexual barriers that exist because the groups are so different. Less heterosis is within each group, although here you can get a pretty good heterosis between temperate and tropical Japonica, okay? There used to be another group called Japonica that was considered to be a, a different group here, but nowadays the consensus is that it's part of the temperate Japonica. It used to be classified because it was particularly isolated to the region of Java, and essentially the market analysis and the isozyme studies indicate that essentially they're the same as the temperate Japonica, okay? So now a little bit about the biology and morphology of the plant. The rice plant is an annual plant. Uh, the cycle of production depends on the cultivar and the area where you grow rice, but it can be as short as three months and it can be as long as nine months. But it's usually an annual period. It's a short day plant, which means that it will flower only on, on their critical uh, late end of less than 12 hours. Okay, so in order for you to produce rice, you need short days. Even though it's also a facultative flowering plant, which means that uh, even if you have long days, eventually it will flower, okay? Wild species tend to be, wild relatives of rice tend to be more sensitive to photo period than cultivated rice because we have selected in different environments and we have selected for photo period insensitive in rice, okay? At the same time, it's almost 100% self, uh, although it exists some out outcrossing in rice, uh, it, it, even though it's a small percentage, it's highly significant, especially in a breeding program. Uh, it also outcrosses re readily with uh, uh, the weedy species and you can see this in a field, if you go to a field of rice, you will see even in breeding programs where once you go before you harvest the seed, you have to go and rough out and eliminate all the wild types, especially by the color of the seed. You let them seed and once you see the red color, you have to eliminate everything that is in that lot in order to avoid the contamination of seed. And that's a pretty good marker. And uh, even though rice grows in water and it requires some, and sometimes water to grow, uh, it's not an aquatic plant uh, by itself per se. It doesn't have the, the stones in, in a way like some aquatic plants will have it. And this physiology is not one of an aquatic plant, okay? So here is a typical rice plant with three tillers. Essentially a tiller is just a stem with some leaves. And the rice plant essentially has a main tiller and then secondary tiller. Uh, the main tiller is the one that essentially, if you see here, this one is about to flower. That would be the main tiller, it would be the biggest one. It has nothing to do with order of, of, of how the, they emerge. It's essentially the dominant tiller. Then you also have secondary tiller, which is also a genetic control factor. Uh, here you have a typical flower of rice. This is the capsule where all the organs are inside. The female and male organs are inside. And once pollination occurs inside, when the, when the capsule is closed and when the extrusion of the anthers occurs, that's when the plant has already been pollinated, okay? That's why it's almost completely 100% pollinated. Some, some varieties and some of the species in, in Orisa tend to open before they are completely pollinated, and that's where you get some of the outcrops. Okay? And here's a typical panicle and some of the grains of rice. But at the same time, uh, there is variation in flowering time. Uh, here are the different stages of the flowering. 
Uh, here's one where the panicle has initiated. This usually occurs after uh, as, as, as a basic period of time uh, rise. If you were to divide uh, the life cycle of a rice plant, and you, you divide it by the vegetative and the reproductive stage, there's a uh, there's some time here in the vegetative, probably half of it that is called the basic vegetative stage in rice. We usually take between zero to th 30 months. And this is a time when no matter what the, the, the sunlight, the photo period, and the, and the conditions are outside, the plant will never flower. It will never be ready to be induced to go into the reproductive stage. Once the rice plant has crossed this barrier, if a change in, in lighting, for example, or, or in temperature occurs, the plant is ready to jump into the reproductive phase. But there's a basic period of time where uh, the plant will never flower, even if you give it the right and, and conditions, okay? So once that occurs and uh, the plant has received the signal, the panicle uh, extrusion starts. <clears throat> Here's the panicle initiation. Uh, this is when it starts coming out from the flag leaf. Uh, here's a full panicle, a little bit like, uh, and this, from this point to this point is probably 24 hours. And then you get flowering. And flowering is just when you see some of the anthers are outside already. That's when it's flowering. And flowering can occur from the top to the base of the, of the panicle. Is, sometimes it occurs the other way around, but it usually that's the way how you measure flowering. Okay? Uh, if you were to breed, because you know that most of, by this point, the plants, the flowers have already been pollinated. You have to get in between here, these two periods, and get into the flower in order to make a cross, okay? And that's where you will open up, get some scissors, cut here, and emasculate each flower individually. Yeah. Do you guys have some systems like the people in sorghum have, the plastic bag made that do? Oh, yeah. So, for example, here, if you were to make a cross here with this panicle, the first thing you would do is you cut the flag leaf, you clip the flag leaf, then you open up each flower. So a panicle will have between 100 to 250 fl individual flowers. So you will go and individually open up each flower. And then we have a small vacuum. And just soak out the anthers. Leave the female part intact. And then get a plant like this one, for example. Get it close to it. Put it together with some uh, cutting qualities, like uh, twisty ties. Get them married put a bag in it and just flip it over. And then the thing is that fly, also the, the pollen in rice is, is released two times a day, from 8 to 9 in the morning and from 3 to 5 in the afternoon. So you have to make sure that you come around and bang the bag a couple of times during the day for the next two days. And then you will get some nice pollination. Um, the other thing is that if you don't have plants that are, especially in the field, if you have plants that are planted in different parts and you want to cross them, you can do supplementary pollination by just cutting out the, the panicle, putting it in water, and keeping it for a couple of days. And then you can go to each plant, open up the bag, put the panicle inside, and move around just with the panicles that where you're pollinating. Okay. And that's to give you some complementary pollination. Uh, in the field, it's more difficult. But when we do it in, in the greenhouse, we can move the pots around. So that's no problem. Uh, the most important part, as we were going to see in some of the hybrid breeding program, is the synchronization of flowering. Uh, that's the most important part in any breeding program. If you don't have flowers, you cannot breed. And in this case, in rice, uh, the, the variation between cultivars is very important. And it's very sensitive. So you either do multiple seeding, or you, if you know the parents uh, well enough, you know when to plant them by different dates. Okay. There are some chemical applications that we can use to either um, uh, enhance flowering or delay it, depending on the conditions that we want. But essentially, that's the most important thing that you need to do, is to know your, your, your parent lines and to control the flowering. OK? Yeah. Any questions? So who breeds rice and what rice breeding programs are really important out there? Uh, it's interesting enough that most of the rice in the world is bred by the public sector or national programs. 
And uh, some of the most important national programs, of course, China, India, Japan, and Brazil, they are very active. India is so active that it has two national programs. Um, and uh, for example, also by international institutes like IRI, SIAT, Embrapa, and WARDA. And some of the newer hybrids and, and, and varieties are also produced by private sector here in, in, in the States. There's a company called RiceTech that uh, also breeds. And here are some of the symbols of the institutes. Uh, most of these international institutes have a very close relationship. And when you work in the rice world, it's nice because uh, still, uh, even though there are intellectual property issues and stuff like that, it's not as oppressive as in other crops. Okay, and you can exchange materials, and uh, even if you can pass, uh, you know, national safety, security things. Um, but the cooperation there is still there, and it's more of a community effort. Okay, and this gives rise to, for example, the. Uh, genetic resources that are available for breeders. And this is an example. This is the International Rice Gene Bank that is managed by IRI. It's uh, the biggest collection of germplasm for a particular crop. And it has uh, more than 90,000 samples to date of cultivated and, and, and wild rice. Uh, and they keep doing these expeditions to collect more and more rice. Uh, it is preserved in an in a installation that is essentially you know, safe against everything, nuclear attacks, uh, you know, uh, tsunamis, uh, whatever you can imagine, you can throw to this installation and it will never be destroyed, or at least that's what they hope. Um, it has two collections, one that is called the working collection and one that is called the core collection. The core collection is one that is supposed to last more than 100 years, and it has been contributed with samples from more than 100 countries that have essentially donated and give this germplasm freely, okay? So that's what I mean about being one of the examples where an international effort has been put in order for this germplasm to be available to anyone. And you as a breeder, if you want something, for example, if you're interested in a trait like aluminum resistance or tolerance, you can essentially go to the gene bank, look for the lines that have uh, some resistance or the people know that it has some characteristics about being resistant to aluminum, see which ones are available in the working collection order it, and they will send it wherever you are, okay? You don't even have to pay shipping. They will send it to you. And there is uh, also, uh, these materials are maintained on, under minus 20 degrees Celsius, and so they are well protected, and there's a backup here in the States, uh, in, I think in Fort Collins in Colorado. So, you know, it's, it's well kept, and it's one of the best resources out there in terms of variation for rice. At the same time, when you're breeding, uh, there are different types of crosses that you can do. Uh, so the most typical ones are the single crosses in which essentially you get two parents, whatever two parents you have, make a cross and get an F1 and that's it. And then just subsequently self that line and produce your variety. Uh, the, the advantages of the single cro crossover is that, that you essentially can cross as many plants and as many parents as you want, especially the females. And once you have identified the best ones, you keep them and you continue working with them. Another important type of cross is the back crosses in which you have guys have seen is, is the one essentially where an F2 or an F1 line essentially gets back crossed to one of the, of the parents. In this case, that parent is called a recurrent parent. And the only thing that you want is a specific trait being introgressed into your line, okay? Either disease resistance, uh, insect resistance or something that is, is missing in your line and that you want to improve it or incorporate it. So that's the back cross. There's another one called the top cross, that, which is less used these times, and it's also called three-way cross. It was essentially you get an F1, and then you cross it with another parent. Okay, and then will be a, a third parent, and then you will produce an F2, and then subsequently produce the, your, your variety. And then, of course, the double crosses in which you essentially cross two F1s. Okay. So my question would be, when will you use a top cross or a double cross instead of a single cross if you get this, essentially the same benefits? What are the benefits of doing this type of cross versus this one? Or in what situations you guys would do that as breeders? If you can think of one right now. Yeah, that's one, that's one. At the same time, one more practical one would be when you have two parents that are poor seed setters, okay? 
So at the end of the day, you want to produce a lot of seeds. And if the first cross gives you very poor setting, you can get another line that is similar to one of the parents, but essentially is prolific in terms of pollen production or seed production, and then you can cross it to see if you get more seed out of it, okay? And that's one of the main reasons also why practically you use different crosses like that. Here, you're right in these cases to get more variation inside, okay? But anyway, it, it doesn't matter what type of breeding or crosses you're making in rice. There are certain characteristics that you need to maintain in a rice breeding program in order for you to be successful. And the first one I think is, is important and everybody tends to forget a little bit about it, especially when you're in grad school. You have to be systematic and keep good records. Uh, that's probably the most important one. You wouldn't imagine how many times you get seeds from your colleagues and they will tell you, okay, it's this line. And it's in this generation and you have this characteristic and this is the marker scores and this is your genotype and you're set, you're gone. There are some long hanging fruits for you to pick up there. And you're, you get excited, you plant everything out. And then you see something different. They tell you this is white, and then it's red. So stuff like that happens, and, 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 and it's because of just the amount of, of seeds and, and crosses that you're able to make, and the numbers get overwhelmed at some point. And then the second part that is really important in a rife, especially in a self-pollinated species, is that you have to have a huge amount of crossing. Uh, there's, uh, and, and, and the reason being is that most of these uh, inbred species have already have uh, most of their uh, sites low size and genome homozygous. So you have to create the most variation possible out there. And the only way that you can do that is by crossing as many parents and as many individuals as you can. Then if you do that, you have to have an effective way of screening. And if you don't have that, you won't be able to, to essentially select the good from the bad. And you have to identify lines early enough. And the reason is because these plants tend to go into homozygosity really fast. So you have to be able to identify superior lines at the F2 level, at the F3 level. If you go a little bit beyond that, then your selection starts getting very deficient. And that's typical of any inbreeding species, okay? In an outcross species, you can even keep some of the worst ones, you know, the worst kids of the crosses and hoping that it, they're gonna get better, but in an inbreeding uh, population, it's gonna be gone fast. And at the same time, you have to do it in multi-locations in the nursery sites. You have to be able to collaborate with people in different environments. And this is very important in rice. So some of the breeding methods in rice, especially for the production of varieties and inbred, the most widely used one is the pedigree method, method and some of the older ones that we have already studied, like bulk breeding, single seed descent, anterculture, and back cross breeding. Okay? And you guys are a little bit familiar with everything. Uh, it has been discussed in, on class, but let's review a little bit. Here's the pedigree method and the bulk method in one uh, side to side, in which essentially the pedigree method is two parents. You produce an F1 here, then self that line and produce an F2, plant them widely, space in the field, and select plants individually. At that point here, you're gonna harvest an individual panicle from one plant, and just one panicle. And then plant each of the selection in a row type of keeping the families apart from one another. And you will keep selecting from those rows until you go to a homozygous line here. Okay, uh, at this time here, you will probably have different selection criteria in each of the, of the phases of your breeding program. The bulk method is a little bit simpler in which essentially you let natural selection work. There you cross two parents, bulk the F1, Select, plant them again, bulk them again, and continue doing the process for like to an F5, where you select individual plants and plant them in rows again. Again, select again, and you continue doing the process essentially and let natural selection work, okay? And this is what I mean where you have to be able to identify superior individuals early on, because if you don't identify them here, you lose the best ones early on. And some of the selection criteria, you as a plant breeder, you have to have specific criteria for each specific phase, and this is something that most people don't talk about in class, but this is what, uh, you will have a big chart of what type of, of selection pressures you're gonna put into your population, and it's nice if you have it in each of the phase of your program. You won't be disorganized in practice, but this is just to give you an, an idea. The F1, 
because we just plant everything that we obtain. At the F2, we already start selecting either for plant type, grain shape, maturity. F4, we already start screening for disease resistance. I might be interested in fungal pathogens that, that is in my area or whatever. And I start applying that pressure just to see which ones are resistant at that point. And an F1 and an F5, we already start trying the, the milling and the yield and the grain quality traits. And I have to do that early on. Uh, in other species like maize or sorghum, where you have a lot of outcrossing, you would probably go a little bit down the line and, feel, and wait a little bit more to do those trials. But in rice, you have to do it really fast. Okay? I think it's the same in soybean. I'm not sure. But this is uh, just an example of the selection criteria that you can include. And you can include anything else that you want or that is important for you, nematode, whatever. And so you can imagine this table looking like the size of these two tables together. So this is how it works a little bit out there. Some other breeding methods that are less known here. Uh, hybrid breeding is mostly done in China, India, and Vietnam. Uh, mm -hmm. The reasons being economically and the, the cost effectiveness that you can do there, the, the, the hybrids. Most of the technology has been developed in China. Uh, Erie is trying to uh, essentially uh, uh, give more emphasis into the hybrid production for other parts of the world, and they are working strongly in doing that. Uh, there is also transgenic uh, production of rice. You all of you have heard of golden rice, but there are other less like uh, the, you know uh, herbicide resistant uh, and other traits that have been put into the rice by transgenic means. Mutation breeding. Most of uh, there's a variety in the West Coast uh, that is called Cal Rose here. And that race, uh, and that variety was obtained by gamma ray uh, exposition of, of rice seed, okay? And the, the particular thing about that line is that it gives, has a, a specific composition of, of, uh, of a starch that allows it to produce a specific type of rice, okay? Uh, pure line selection, molecular breeding, and also double haploids, and apomixis also. So those are different methods that are coming out. So let's talk a little bit about hybrid production uh, is uh, the objective of any hybrid program is the exploitation of heterosis. Uh, and like I said before, the, ma the maximum heterosis in rice is observed when you cross an indica and a japonica. And the main problem with that is the reproduction barriers, okay, that is obtained from that cross. Um, other crosses that, uh, other subspecies crosses, interspecific crosses that gives you good uh, uh, heterosis is a glabarima times an indica. That's a good cross, too. And you have like 15 to 20 yield advantage between a traditional variety and a hybrid. Okay. China, Vietnam, and India are the ones that are planting the most of the hybrid out there. And in China, for example, in the last three years, they have been able to increase production by 25% just by planting hybrids. And the Chinese plan is to plant most of their high rice yield in the uh, producing areas in the next 10 years with hybrid seeds, okay? And the requirements for any hybrid rice production is the male sterile lines. And here are the bags that you were talking about. This is a guy doing the cross here. You have to do it by hand, there's no other way. He's opening in the flowers there, and once you make the flower, you bag them together, and here you put the type of cross you make, and if it's a self or end the date and stuff that you might be interested in, you put it in there, okay? So there are different male sterility in rice. Um, there are two types. It can be genetic or non-genetic. And uh, the genetic one can be a cytoplasmatic male sterility, just like the one we saw in, in sorghum. And interestingly enough, there's also what is called environmental sensitive sterility. Uh, the non-genetic one is a chemically induced one with uh, gametocytes or pollen killers. And the cytoplasmatic male sterility is essentially the system that is called the tree line system in which you have uh, the cytoplasmatic male sterile, the maintainer line, and the restorer line, okay, which are also called the A, B, and R line, okay. Then the environmental sensitive one is what is called a, a, a mutation that is dependent on, on the environment. In this case, it can be temperature or photo period, and there's a combination of them, okay. And here is the three-line hybrids and the two-line hybrids, okay? 
So in the three line system, you have, like, a, like I said, the A line, which is the cytoplasmatic male sterile, the maintainer, the B line, the restorer line. And here, you encounter certain problems. Even though the cytoplasmatic male sterile is a plant, is a line that is widely used in hybrid production, there are some uh, genetic barriers that are produced because of the cytoplasm in, in those lines. Uh, the difficulty of this system is that uh, it's expensive because of the, of the labor that is necessary involved to maintain the tree lines. And the system itself is complicated as you need to always maintain the lines in isolated fields before you start making the hybrid production. And here is just a panicle of a typical uh, male sterile line. And you can see that the anthers are not fully open. And, and the anthers, actually, when you see them individually, are essentially real there. Here's a typical field of, of, uh, of a tree line hybrid. Here are the planting day. And here the scheme okay, of, of the planting in the fields. Here you have your A line or the male sterile planted in, in these rows. And then you're going to have the, res the, the restorer lines planted or the pollinators planted on the side of the field. Okay? And the wind probably will be going both ways so you can get some good pollination. The thing is that in order for you to coordinate the flower and in the field, you have to plant the pollinators in different type times. Okay? So here, the, the clear uh, circles are the first planted ones, the ones with the liner, the second planted, and the, the field ones are the third planted. And that's what you usually do. And that's what it requires a lot of time and effort. You always have to plant the pollinators three or four times in the same field. Okay. The chemical-induced hybrids is a little bit simpler and more cost-effective. Essentially, you can make any cross with any parent that you're interested in, make the hybrid, select for the best heterotic combination, plant them together, it doesn't matter. And then you just spray some lines and make them male sterile and leave some lines that are the pollinators. So here you're going to have the, the pollen donor without being sprayed, and in the middle you're going to have the female plants which are pollinated. That's right. Yes, exactly. With arsenic compounds, you spray them. And you do that by planting these ones first. Okay? And you let them flower. And when they're flower, you spray them. Then let the pollinators come up a little bit later. Okay? Because they are specific to the flowering. They don't affect any other organ. That's how you control them. But as you said, the main problem is that they are chemically induced. And they give you cancer. So. <laughs> But in China, there's a lot of people, so it's okay. <laughs> and that's why they only use it in China. <laughs> uh, the sterility that is dependent on the, on the climate is also very difficult to maintain. And maybe, oh, here it is. So for example, here you have the two types of sterility, the genetic and non-genetic. But here, in this part here, is the ones that is dependent on the climate. So there are four types of, of uh, sterility within the climate, the dependent ones. You have the temperature, the reverse temperature, the photo period dependent, the reverse photo period dependent, and the combination of both of the temperature and photo period. And what that means, for example, in, in the, just for, to give you an example, the temperature dependent is where you grow, the line will be sterile if you grow at a low temperature, okay? But it's reversible if you plant the line in high temperature, it's fertile. If you grow it in low, it's sterile. And that's when you use it as a female plant, okay? That's what you do. But essentially, you also have to isolate the field because pollen of rice can travel up to 100 meters. So you have to have at least 100 meters between those fields and any other thing that is planted around. Okay? And those have to be completely isolated. But this is a, to give you an idea of how complicated is that. And, and also, all this technology has mostly developed by the Chinese, and they, they have it down to, to, to the pin. Okay? And why hybrid production is so expensive is because it involves all these steps that you see there. Okay. And especially here, there are some ones, like I said, flower and synchronization at the beginning is very important. The only way that you can guarantee that the two lines are going to flower or that they're going to be uniform is going to be transplanting. Okay, then one of the most important things that you need to do also in the field when you're producing hybrid rice is to make sure that all your lines have the same height. So you have to apply gibberellic acid at some point. And I think it's here. 
And the reason you apply geraleic acid is essentially to either <laughs> make sure that all your lines are uniform in terms of height, okay? At the same time, you need to do some supplementary pollination, roughing out of anything that you are not, uh, that is not a hybrid cross, and harvest and starts all your force harvest management. And, and that's everything. Every single operation has to be by human labor. There's no other way. Some of the traits that are interesting for rice breeding, of course, is yield and their, in its components. Um, some abiotic tolerance like drought, aluminum, uh, lodging. And this is, I think, unique to rice submergence. Those are the rice that are resistant to inundations and water flows. And um, a graduate from Cornell works on that. And he has these big uh, pools of rice where he essentially puts the rocks on the pots and drowns the rice and see which ones survive. Uh, biotic resistance to different diseases and insects. Nutritional, like I mentioned before, uh, main ones is protein, vitamin A, iron, calcium, and selenium. Grain quality. The size of the grain is what essentially determines the quality of the grain. The milling and the type of flour that you can obtain from, from those grains are also important. Physiological, well, the control of flowering time and also the photo period. And uh, with the advent of uh, molecular biology, the evolutionary and domestication traits. Those are really interesting uh, for most of the breeders out there. Here are some of the common diseases of rice uh, here in the States. Rice blast, sheath blight, brown spot, false moth, and this other tree. Here's an example of, uh, I think it's rice blast. And the type of damages that it produces essentially reduces the photo, uh, synthetic area. Some of the challenges for the future of rice breeding is that uh, essentially you have to increase the production in areas where the green revolution didn't reach, for example, Africa. Uh, that's a clear example where the package, the technological package of the Green Revolution didn't work. Uh, higher yielding varieties that are able to produce more food with less resources, inputs, water, and what, and what have you. And I think one of the things that uh, nobody wants to talk about is the essential, the production of greenhouse gases in, in, in paddy rice. It's the number one producer of methane in the world, and somehow that has to come into control to have a sustainable production system. Certainly, as young uh, breeders, I think, is how to make sense of all the overflow of information that is coming from rice. Uh, rice is a genetic model, and by so, like most uh, organisms that are genetic models, they have the whole genome sequence. Rice has two genome sequence, has uh, an abundance of markers available. Most of these genes have been mapped. A lot of them are being cloned. And uh, to make sense of that information uh, is really overwhelming sometimes. And you know, you, how to take out the important things out of that is going to be a real challenge. And how to make sense of that information is going to be a real challenge. Here is a good example of some of the good works that are going out there. These are the NERICA lines. And NERICA stands for New Rice Varieties for Africa. And it's a cross between Sativa and Glaberima. And essentially, this is the guy who developed it. His name is Monty Jones. He was the World Food Prize winner in 2003. And it has led in, I think the, the varieties have only been in production for five years. And it has led to 50% reduction of rice importation in sub-Saharan Africa. And these lines are being planted and, and widely promoted to the rest of, uh, of, of some other countries in Africa at this point. And I think uh, this type of work is the ones that can have significant impact in the food security of the world. Uh, let's see. Some of all the other things that are going on in rice, a lot of you have heard of cute hill analysis. And this is essentially the strategy for mapping and, and cloning QTLs. This is the one that has been uh, developed here at Cornell and applied in Susan McCush lab. And here you have essentially a, a, what is called an advanced back cross program. You have the recurrent parent and the wild donor. Produce the F1 and start doing the back crosses. This is the number of, of crosses that you make and the number, one, uh, the number of selections that goes to the next generation. Again, the same tier and produce the segregating population, do the marker analysis with the multi-location field test. And there's where you do put the data in the computer, get the QTL, go back to the select, selected the lines that are the, the important ones and start doing the, the nil selection, okay? And in five years, you graduate with a degree. 
I think that's it what I have right now for right soon. If you guys have any questions right now, please let me know. Yeah. You can do it. You can do it in any with any segregating population. You can either get an F2 here and you can do it there. That's no problem. You can do it here in the that's why you take it here in the BC2 F2. That's why you only need a segregating population. You can do it here too. Yeah, there's no problem. Some people do that. But here, because it's, we're using a wild donor, we want to get rid of as many negative traits as we can. Yeah, because this is a, a lot of linkage drag comes from the wild. So for example, in a cross between the two pictures that I show you, the Jefferson and the Rufi, a lot of negative traits come into play. And you want to get rid of, of, of as much as you can, as quick as you can too. So that's why you would rather do two back crosses, two continuous back crosses, and then see what's segregating. Okay, so here instead of having 50% roofy, you're gonna have 25% roofy genes in, in the genome. Yep. Questions? All right, I think just in time.